Watch this. Apparently, there's been some business being handled by some members of Idaho's legislature, even during the prolonged session recess. Another ethics investigation into another member of the House of Representatives will come to a head in a committee meeting next month, this time for what Representative Giddings posted to social media. You won't need a COVID vaccine to attend Boise State this fall. That's a fact. Unless, of course, you happen to be in the health sciences department. And that is not sitting well with at least one lawmaker. He served his country, even when his country failed to view him as equal. Decades later, he's being recognized as a hero in the gem state. Since the day Jane Doe, the 19-year-old statehouse intern, stepped into that House Ethics Committee hearing to answer questions from committee members about the alleged sexual assault she survived at the hands of then-Representative Aaron Von Ellinger, there were questions about whether Von Ellinger should be the only one facing an ethics hearing. Representative Priscilla Giddings of Whitebird was a witness that day, testifying on behalf of Von Ellinger. When she was questioned about outing the name and picture of Von Ellinger's accuser on social media. Actions unbecoming a representative, many said. And since April, that question of whether Representative Giddings will have to answer for those actions went, well, unanswered. Until today. Sage Dixon, the chairman of the House Ethics Committee, Representative Sage Dixon, announced this morning they have officially received two complaints against Representative Giddings and stating the committee conducted a preliminary investigation finding probable cause exists that misconduct may have occurred. The House Ethics Committee will hold a public hearing on August 2nd. 24 representatives, including 16 Republican and 8 Democrats, signed those letters of complaint. And they explained it as such, wanting everyone to know Members of the Idaho House of Representatives are expected and required to uphold high standards of ethical conduct as part of their commitment to the people of Idaho. The Ethics and House Policy Committee is conducting an ongoing ethics investigation into one of our members, and we're looking forward to a transparent and fair hearing. The complaints listed a couple of reasons. One, Representative Giddings posted the name and picture of the accuser on her Facebook page for the whole world to see and then feigned ignorance about it. Two, she implied there was a monetary motivation for the ethics investigation into Von Ellinger instead of, you know, an ethical one. So I guess the record long legislative session of 122 days will reconvene for at least one more day on August 2nd. And while that was being digested, we got word Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan was going to be acting governor again today. And we all remember what happened last time. But this time, we didn't get an executive order issued. Instead, while Governor Little is in Colorado with other Republican governors, the acting governor, well, she sent a formal inquiry to Idaho's Department of Health and Welfare, and she's asking Director Dave Jepson if there are any incentives for Idaho health care providers to impose vaccine requirements on their employees. I would assume other than trying to keep staff and patients safe. In that email, McGeehan says she talked with Governor Little last week and asked him directly why St. Luke, St. Alphonsus, and Primary Health all made the same requirement on the same day. She said the governor's response, it's not a state issue. In her press release, McGeehan mentioned a possible federal incentive for healthcare personnel vaccinations. And she pulls from a proposed 721 page federal rule from the Biden administration that apparently calls for adopting the quote COVID-19 vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel measure beginning with fiscal year 2023, 2023 program year. And she calls for publicly report, or I should say that same report calls for the publicly reporting the vaccination rates of healthcare providers. So McGeehan asked the question, could this new federal policy be the underlying incentive driving Idaho's healthcare providers to mandate vaccines and intrude upon the personal health choices of their employees, their contractors and vendors? Well, I guess our question would be, how would vaccine requirements that start this fall be incentivized by what happens in a fiscal year that doesn't start until October 2022. She also says she's troubled the Biden administration would want to track the vaccination status of Idahoans, even though Idaho already has a program in place that does just that. We learned late this afternoon, Director Jepson received the letter from Lieutenant Governor, Acting Governor, and will work to get her the information she requested, just as he would with any such request from any elected official. Okay, so this is where those private and public entities entwine. 
when it comes to vaccine requirements. Back in April, Governor Brad Little signed an executive order that said no department agency, no department that is, agency that would be the board, commission, or other executive branch entity. Let me finish this off here. Or that would be official of the state of Idaho shall require as a condition of accessing state services or facilities that an individual produce proof he or she has received a COVID-19 vaccine. That no department, agency, board, or commission applies to Idaho state-run institutions of higher learning. And those schools like Boise State University, University of Idaho, Idaho State University, will not be requiring COVID vaccines when classes resume this fall. But Boise State University has a health sciences department, which includes nursing and such, and they happen to have clinical partnerships with the area's major health care providers. That would be St. Luke's, St. Alphonsus, and Primary Health. And that partnership allows those students to get internship experience with patients sometimes. The big three that recently required all of their employees to get the coronavirus vaccine by this fall or face finding another job. And they couldn't exactly require that of their employees and then allow unvaccinated students into their facilities to get that firsthand experience. Now, could they? Which is why back on July 15th, last Thursday, Boise State Radiology Department sent out an email to its students saying, if you haven't already gotten vaccinated from COVID, you will be required to do so by the start of fall classes on August 23rd or risk losing a seat in the program. Representative Chad Christensen then posted that letter on social media under the headline. Here is BSU's threatening email telling students they must be vaccinated for COVID. A bit misleading to say the least, if not misinformation, because the letter states very clearly. We do understand that this news may not be some may not be what some of you wish to hear and want you to know that this is solely coming from our clinical partners and not Boise State University. So it's not a state entity requiring a COVID vaccine. A point of fact, Representative Christensen conceded today when we spoke with him. Yeah, I see, I see both sides of that. I see, you know, I see that, you know, it is coming from these, these clinical partners, but I also see Boise State you know, facilitating this in a sense by putting this letter out and saying you're required to do it. Um, you know, I, I don't want to put the blame all on BSU. I'm not trying to do that. I, you know, I, I, I don't want BSU to stand up for the students to say, hey, you know, to these, you know, these clinical partners saying, hey, our students don't want to do this. And I guess my question then to you is what are their options? There are only so many clinical partners that they can partner with when it comes to these radiology students getting the firsthand experience that they need to complete the program. You know, I, I don't know their options. You know, that's, that's a good point. Um, you know, I, I just want to see BSU, you know, you know, you know, try to advocate for their students and, and, and try to, you know, you know, you know, facilitate these students that they, you know, they don't have to get vaccinated if they don't want to get vaccinated. Going to work in a hospital is, is pretty, I mean, that carries a lot of responsibility as a student. And so I'm sure there are a lot of other requirements that these hospitals put on these students, whether it's, you know, wearing masks, you have to wear clothes, you got to wash your hands, get a flu vaccine. How would this be different in your opinion? It's different to me because the, the vaccine hasn't been FDA approved yet. I mean, all those other vaccinations that have been FDA approved that are required to get the flu vaccination or other vaccinations that these are, these are students are, are getting to be in that program already FDA approved. This is, um, this is experimental vaccination, hasn't been FDA approved yet. So I see a problem with that. And, I, and so are, are these partners willing to take responsibility for these you know, possible you know, adverse effects? Is BSU willing to do that? You mentioned experimental drug or experimental vaccine. That gets tossed around a lot. Right. And, and I, that's kind of where I think a lot of people take issue with that, that it's not necessarily and it, not at all experimental, but that it is emergency use, use authorized. So there's a very big difference between experimental and authorized for emergency use. We'll go with that. That's fine. I, I'm, okay. You know, my point is it's not FDA approved yet. Well, if it gets FDA approval by the end of this year, would that change your opinion? I'd probably back off a little more. Um, I still don't like people being forced to put stuff in their bodies they don't want to put in their bodies. So is it safe to say then you're in favor of the state of Idaho going into session or coming back to session and then talking about what a private employer can require of its employees? I'm all for employer rights, but I do believe there's a line that's, that's, the, that's taking place, you know, needs to be, that shouldn't be crossed. You know, for me, this just this, this crosses a line. If you, you know, require somebody to put something in their body, something that's health related, something that they don't believe in, and that you know can alter their, you know their their health, you know, for for the worse or for the better, it doesn't matter. But you know, to me, that that crosses a line for me.
Did you get the vaccine? No. Do you plan to? No. Okay. Even if it's FDA approved? <laughs> I don't get a lot of vaccinate, vaccines anyway. I mean, I, 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 I do get, well, I, you know, I'm, I was in the Army, so I got, you know, the whole smorgasbord when I was in the Army. But. Could you refuse them? <laughs> no, you can't refuse them there. That's right. That's different. Right. Wait, how is that different? I, I guets a good question or a good point. How is that different? Right. right. Than- you know, I, you know, if, if, if I didn't take them, I, 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 I you know, would probably get got discharged. I'm sure, but uh, you know, it's not different. You're right. You know, I, I back in '97 when I went into the army, I did. I wasn't, uh, you know, the same mindset I am today. And I, I don't know, if, you know, if I would, what, what, you know, what I would have done back then if I would had the same mindset as I do today. But it was basically an employer requirement for you to keep your job. You're right. And I did it. I did all those vaccinations in the army, and I, you know, anthrax, all those nasty things, and big old needles, and yeah. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would have made it to the army if I <laughs> with the same mindset today that I have today. So at this point, Boise State doesn't seem to be planning on cutting ties with their clinical partners over this vaccination requirement. While that letter Representative Christensen posted would only affect. BSU 75 radiology students. The school is planning on issuing a more formal follow up letter to all health sciences students with clinical requirements, basically explaining they face the same thing and this wouldn't be their only requirement. Already, such students face background checks before being admitted into the program. They also have to pass an annual drug and alcohol test, including a TB test. They have to get an hepatitis B vaccine, an MMR vaccine, a chicken pox vaccine and a flu shot if their internship happens between October and February. All right, well, don't shoot the messenger here. COVID cases across the United States continue to rise, including here in Idaho. And things were looking better and better this past spring, but now the Delta variant is creating new issues. That Delta variant of COVID believed to be far more contagious than other strains, and its recent emergence in North America is a key factor for experts when explaining why we are seeing such a surge in new cases. You couple that with less than desirable vaccine rates and you've got a fresh set of issues as we head into this fall. A major concern how recent COVID trends will affect Idaho schools this fall. And Joe Paris, you heard from Idaho's experts Mm -hmm. today on this topic. He joins us with insight on what these schools could look like when it comes to COVID this fall. A major point still uh, for those under 12 vaccines and kind of where we stand with that. Yeah, I mean, there's still not a vaccine, Brian, for those under 12. So long story short, people are asking, well, what's the difference between this fall and really heading into last fall? Um, there, there's no really fact that you know has prompted questions about why school districts are telling students that there will be no masks required this fall. Now, the major districts here in the Valley, including Boise, West Ada, Nampa and Caldwell, they've all taken the stance that they will not require masks this fall. Of note, when those decisions were made earlier this year, the COVID situation in Idaho, a lot different than what we're seeing right now. Now, just today, Health and Welfare Director Dave Jepson said, quote, Unfortunately, I wish I had better news. The overall state COVID numbers have taken a turn for the worse in the past few weeks. All the key COVID-19 items that we watch closely are now heading the wrong direction. In part, the root of the problem is suspected to be more contagious Delta variant. Now, I spoke to school parents who asked why students who can't get a vaccine yet, those under 12, why would they be asked to wear a mask a year ago, but not now? Simply put, a year ago, the virus was circulating and the best defense was aggressive COVID protocols like masks. Well, the best defense right now is a vaccine, but again, There's not one available for most elementary and middle school students. Now I asked state epidemiologist Dr. Christine Hahn if there was a scientific argument against having kids mask up this fall if they can't get a vaccine. Here's her insight. There was a study that had been published uh, recently that had suggested, you know, carbon dioxide buildup behind the mask. Some parents or some people were concerned about that and that has been retracted. So right now there is no scientific evidence of any harm, you know, for the vast majority of people, including children, to wear masks. Uh, And so, as Elke mentioned, really, it's going to be a policy decision. There's not a scientific reason to not wear masks, I guess is the way I put it, uh, that it's really going to be a policy decision on the part of the schools with hopefully our uh, advisory committee's input. And you just heard Dr. Hahn allude to the fact that health and welfare, they will soon be meeting with education stakeholders in the coming weeks to talk about the science behind what's happening right now in Idaho and what considerations there should be for COVID protocols. So beyond that, 
Another question, at what point would health and welfare recommend stricter COVID protocols like masks indoor for everyone, regardless of vaccine status, like we're seeing in Los Angeles, California right now? Well, Director Jepson couldn't really give a, a real specific of a tipping point where they would actually change their recommendations, but he did say that they are going to continue to monitor important data like hospital and ICU capacity, as well as case counts. Brian, there's a belief uh, among the scientific community that there is a situation heading into the fall where things could could lead to another wave of COVID. That's something we want to avoid, especially with the vaccine, hopefully available just around the corner for those under 12. All right, really quickly, uh, the Delta variant. We still do not have a really good wave detected out in Idaho. Is that true? The, the state of Idaho will admit they had some trouble in the past of monitoring that Delta variant because it takes time to send it to get it sequenced and to get all the information done. But this afternoon they did announce there's a renewed effort with the local hospitals as well as the VA medical system to work on sequencing more of that variant to get an idea of just how prevalent it is and just early work on that. Brian, they know there's more cases than they thought and that it is assumed that once this variant is in the community and it's contagious, it's out there. And we could start to see those numbers go even higher. Worth pointing out too that uh, carbon monoxide or dioxide study with about masks and kids that they said was retracted. Lieutenant Governor McGeehan quoted that and tweeted that out earlier this month. So now we know that it is no longer viable. All right, thanks, Joe. Uh, he was a fine American and also later in life an outstanding Idahoan. An outstanding Idahoan honored for his service to a country that, at one point, didn't really acknowledge his service. How the Idaho National Guard is working to make sure his name never gets forgotten. But before we get to that, let's get to this. Don't forget to send us your questions and comments about the 208 to the number on your screen. 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. And we're going to share as many as we can at the end of the show. Proud to uh, stand here the day wearing the same uniform that Vernon Baker wore uh, many years ago as he fought for America. On April 5th, 1945, First Lieutenant Vernon Baker of Cheyenne, Wyoming, and 24 of his men found themselves behind enemy lines in Italy. All 25 went up the hill, but only seven came back, including Baker. Despite the death toll, that mission successfully helped the Allies drive German forces out of the region, and for decades, Baker's role was largely overlooked because of his race. At the time of his service, the U.S. Army was segregated. It wasn't until the mid-1990s that a federal grant was established to reevaluate the heroism of blacks in World War II. In 1996, more than 50 years after the end of that war, seven African-American soldiers were finally awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, the nation's highest and most prestigious military decoration. The only one still alive was Vernon Baker. At that point, he had retired to St. Mary's in northern Idaho to pursue his love of hunting. He died at the age of 90 in 2010 and is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Today, almost 80 years after that attack and 15 years after that belated award was presented, the Idaho National Guard at Gowan Field is honoring Baker. This morning, they unveiled their newest barracks 
and it is they are adorned with his name. Hundreds gathered today to celebrate out there, including Baker's wife, Heidi, and Senator Melissa Wintrow, who helped get this project completed. All the hardships he had to go through as a younger person, he put that behind him. He never, he never got bitter about it. We're just part of his, uh, a part of the same service, and we continue his legacy today. And I'm proud to be part of the same United States Army that Vernon Baker served in. Heidi told us there are little touches hidden throughout the barracks, including a large rock, that one right there that sits just outside, which has an elk on it, highlighting his love of elk hunting. Baker also served in the Korean War and earned several other awards during that time, including a Purple Heart, a Bronze Star, and the Distinguished Service Cross. We can say this about a lot of things, but after a year long absence, thanks to the pandemic, the wildest, fastest show on earth back in Nampa. Those are their words, of course. We're talking about the Snake River Stampede, the rodeo at the Fort Idaho Center. It's one of the top 10 professional rodeos in the country. Cowboys and cowgirls from all over the country come to Nampa every July to compete. It's not just the adults that get to have the fun, though. If you're new to the area, every night starts off with what's called mutton busting. And if you've been to a rodeo, you kind of know what it is. It's pretty simple reenactment of bull riding, but for kids, and you can see that they're on sheep. Yep, five and seven year olds hold on to those woolly and wild sheep for about six seconds, or at least they try to. Happens every night before the start of the rodeo. Not only that, the mutton busting comp competition comes with its own miniature rodeo clown. And this morning, we're able to meet the 11 year old tapped with that, well, pretty big role. Don't let the sheep hit the kids. And try to keep the sheep all together at one end. I just run over there to make sure they're okay. And then if they're not, then I'll get the bigger clown stuff. Don't get to be a clown when you grow up? Yeah. 
The video of the other clown who tried to swat at the sheep to tell him to get off the kid. That's probably the best part. You can catch Landon and all the mutton busters starting tonight, 615, and it happens every night through Saturday. Getting a lot of comments today on the vaccine requirements by private employers here in the state of Idaho requiring their employees to get vaccinated and how that kind of trickles over into BSU students because of the nursing program there. They're not forcing anyone to do anything. You can say no and find another job. This is called freedom of choice. I served to guarantee that, said Jerry. We got a couple of comments like that today. Brian, the military cannot require the COVID shot for per military personnel because it's not FDA approved. Check that out. We didn't say that they were, and we know that but they could eventually, and I'm just talking about the requirements that they had previously. Could you turn those down as an employee of the military? Why is the Army different? You ask, you choose to give up your freedom for service to your country for a specific period of time. However, as a free American citizen, the government has no right to my body, and the government of Idaho hasn't chosen that either.